say for example from uh, much of Central's discussion, uh, really some of the most difficult and interesting problems uh, uh, in condensed matter have to do with Fermi surfaces and that's what I want to discuss today. Uh, and I'll also show a little, ex one ex experimental motivation just for variety, this is not from high TC, uh, but it's a very uh, beautiful system although not as easy to study experimentally. Uh, it's bilayer helium-3, uh, so you have a graphite substrate on it where you put two layers of helium-4 and then you add in two layers of uh, helium-3 with the low, and these layers form triangular lattices. Um, so um, I, I guess I, I don't want to go into the details of the experiments. It, I think the experiments are not very well understood. Uh, but, uh, but the physics of the phases I'm going to discuss today, uh, probably it seems reasonable, uh, has, uh, uh, should have some relevance to some of the things that are being observed. But, but there's an interesting motivation for what I'm going to discuss. So as I promised yesterday, everything I'm going to talk about is motivated by the Hubbard model. So here's the Hubbard model motivated by this bilayer helium-3 system. Uh, I take two triangular lattices, one on top of the other, okay? So I have layer A on the bottom and layer B on the top, uh, and they have their own Hubbard models with the same hop and teeth uh, and the same Hubbard repulsion U. Uh, and the only difference is this number epsilon A, the on-site energy is epsilon A and epsilon B, and I choose them so that if you fill the, the sites in, in exactly this way. That is, you, put, you fill the lower site first and then you start adding uh, the second layer. Uh, so, so in this regime, when you put in some helium atoms, which are fermion, these are helium-3 atoms, uh, they will first start going, going in the lower layer because epsilon A is small. Uh, and, and eventually, until the lower, air, lower, the lower layer will fill up, so you have one, one atom per site. Then the next atom can either go onto this, the lower layer, that will cost energy epsilon A plus U, because it will be repelled by the other atom that's already there. But that's too much, so you, it'll go to the top layer, okay? Uh, and then so, uh, and finally there's this tunneling between the layers W, which allows atoms to move back and forth. All right, so this is, this is the model I want to study, and again, just like the honeycomb lattice model I talked about yesterday, you know, we know essentially zero about, well, we know even less about, the, uh, surely about the phases of this model, but I'm gonna take two likely candidates, and uh, unlike the model I discussed yesterday, these candidates, neither of these candidates will, will, uh, uh, will break any symmetry. Uh, that's one important difference. Uh, secondly, both of these phases will have Fermi surfaces. Uh, that is zero energy fermionic excitations along the whole line in momentum space. And that's also different from anything I discussed yesterday. Uh, uh, and, and so that's going to make the flavor of the discussion quite different. Yeah, question? All right. Okay, so first, of course, just like yesterday, let's put u equals zero and, and understand what are the phases. If I took this uh, Hamiltonian, what would, I, what would I get? Well, of course, for non-interacting, okay, I'm going to end up calling them electrons. I might as well call them electrons from now on. <laughs> but there were helium-3 atoms in that system. Okay, uh, so you have your electrons and you just have to diagonalize the, the matrix, diagonalize the hopping matrix elements. So there's this term here, which gives you a band, just a, roughly a parabolic band on the triangle lattice. There's no direct points, it's just k squared. Let's just take it k squared, and it's just gonna fill some states. Uh, so here's another k squared band. So you have these two bands in layer A and layer B. Uh, so there'll be this is momentum K, uh, and there's layer A, uh, and then there's layer B, which, you know, since uh, layer B has a slightly higher energy, epsilon B is slightly large, so there's B here, and, and so what you would want to do is just take some Fermi level and uh, fill up the lowest energy states. Uh, of course, there's also the W here, and what the W is going to do is mix them, and you get the bonding and anti-bonding orbitals, and so the net, net effect of that, these will be split, and one will be moved up, and the other will be moved down, and it's just going to exaggerate the difference between them. So you get something like this, if you wish. Uh, and now you're going to fill, uh, fill the one electron states up to some point in momentum space. This is now two-dimensional momentum, K here. So there's going to be a circle. Think of this as a paraboloid. So there's going to be a circle, which will be my Fermi surfaces. And you can see I'm going to get you 
uh, sometimes you have two Fermi surfaces uh, if W is not too large. And when W is really large, uh, then I only fill one band. That's it. Okay, so those are the pictures in the next two uh, slides. So for small W, you get two Fermi surfaces, uh, one here and one here. Uh, and then there's a, uh, and of course, since a, these are free electrons so far, uh, the area enclosed by these surfaces must equal the total density of the electrons with some phase space factors that are easy to work out. Uh, now, one of the deep theorems of uh, Fermi liquid theory, so when you turn on small interactions, in fact, even in principle, infinitely large interactions, uh, as long as you're adiabatically connected to this free electron state, uh, what's guaranteed is that this will not be violated. You'll still get a Fermi surface, one or two Fermi surfaces, of course, that's not determined, but this will not be violated. You could, of course, shrink one and, uh, and increase the other as you turn on interaction, that's allowed. But there's just one global sum rule. Strictly speaking, there's two both for spin up and spin down, but I'm going to mainly ignore spin and everything I say today. And so you could either get this situation with a really large Fermi surface or, or this one. And typically, when condensed matter physicists talk about large Fermi surfaces, they mean either of these, that these are all in the class of large Fermi surfaces. So for simplicity, you just draw that. Okay. So that's the Fermi liquid state. So it's a compressible state of matter with no broken symmetries, stable modulo some superconducting instabilities I ignore. Uh, so it's essentially stable at zero temperature, uh, and, uh, has no, and it has this very important theorem on, on the position uh, on the locus uh, of zero energy excitations. All right, so the purpose of today's discussion is to talk about uh, other possible phases that share this characteristic, meaning that they're compressible, that meaning they can appear at any density, change their chemical potential, the density varies continuously, uh, and they don't break any symmetries, and they're, uh, and they're at low temperatures, and, so, and in fact, all of such phases that anybody knows how to construct involve Fermi surfaces in one way or the other. Uh, and so I'll give you, and the, I've talked about the, what I call the FL phase, but I will now also introduce another one called the FL star phase. All right, so we go back to this same Hubbard model. Uh, and now let's look at it, and we want to turn on interactions. To get anything interesting, I have to turn on interactions. So I'll turn it on to make U uh, really large. And just like the strategy I followed yesterday, uh, I'm going to now look at the U limit. Uh, here, even at this level, there'll be uncertainties at what happens. But let's just look at what happens there. So there, what you get is what's called the condo lattice Hamiltonian. And this is the logic behind it. So on the lower layer, this is the layer A, where you have one, one electron per site. Uh, there's the spin of the electron, of course, that makes life interesting. And just like yesterday, you're going to get this Heisenberg antiferromagnet uh, exchange coupling these, these, uh, these electrons. And this J will be T squared over U. OK, but there's also the upper layer. And, and that's uh, a relatively dilute system. Uh, and the way I've written it, uh, you know, it's still got a very large repulsion, but the point is, if it's dilute enough, then I can think of it as, a, uh, I think of the collisions between the particles two by two, and then I should really, what the way I should really expand it is in terms of the T matrix of the two particle collision. And the T matrix is not infinite. It could in fact be quite small when U is infinity. So, so it's in some sense a weakly interacting uh, system. Uh, and so there may perhaps reasonable to just start from free electrons. Okay, so that's also there, and then there's, there's a, but there's a new term that appears when I do this projection uh, where I remove the charge fluctuation on layer A, and that new term is what's called the condo coupling. So there's a condo exchange uh, that will appear when you do this transformation. This is called the Schieffer-Wolf transformation. Uh, none of the people who first discovered it. Uh, and the Schieffer-Wolf transformation leads to this exchange interaction between these electric spins here and also an exchange interaction between a spin here and the spin of any of these moving electrons. And it's local in space because every, all the states you're eliminating are separated by energy U. So there's a clean gap in, in the perturbation you, you do, uh, to, you perform to get this term. So it's a local interaction. All right, so that, that model here uh, with JH and JK and free electron is what people call the condo Heisenberg model, or sometimes just the condo model. 
um, and you know, there's of course many books and thousands of papers written on the properties of this model. <laughs> okay, so having done this, one of the questions I can ask uh, is where is this phase? Is this, is this state uh, that I talked about here, the Fermi lipid phase, which is kind of obvious from the Hubbard model picture, is it present in, in the condo lattice? I mean, it seems like it should. Of course, all you've done is change variables. We haven't changed the physics. And from this point of view, this looked very obvious. You could derive this theorem, uh, which would value for any interaction strength. So it's natural to expect that this large Fermi surface phase uh, is also an eigenstate of this, a ground state of this condo Hamiltonian. Uh, so that, in, indeed, the answer is yes. It involves some uh, somewhat more technical calculations. Which I, which I, towards the end, might refer to. But anyway, it's reasonable to expect that there is a state then, uh, which is this large Fermi surface state. And just like the counting I did here, uh, the area of this Fermi surface uh, will now count all the electrons. So uh, from one level, that's, you know, uh, sounds uh, totally obvious. But from another perspective, that sounds a little mysterious, uh, because as written, this model has only these electrons are mobile. These electrons don't really move, only the spins exchange. But that turns out to be enough to make these electrons also be part of the Fermi surface count. And there are you know, many ways of seeing it, and that's really one of the uh, important achievements uh, of the so-called heavy Fermi liquid theory, uh, showing the existence of this state in the, in the condo lattice. And this kind of state has been very clearly seen in many, many beautiful experiments in the heavy fermion compounds. Okay. Uh, but it's just a Fermi liquid state in, in, from other, another perspective. Uh, what you do get from this new perspective is that the effective mass of the carriers on this Fermi surface can be very different from the mass of an electron, sometimes a thousand times larger, and that's why uh, these are called heavy fermion compounds. But at some level, they're nothing but Fermi liquids, except the effective mass is large. All right, so that's the FL phase. So now I want to introduce the FL star phase. And, and, the way, and the key to that is to now we imagine, again, focus on layer A. And instead of having the electrons on layer A be coupled strongly to the conduction electrons, so as I said here, this kind of phase is very natural when the condo coupling is large, uh, because then each electron kind of delocalizes into the conduction electron C. And that's called the condo screening effect. On the other hand, if I imagine a regime where what this JH J. Heisenberg is more important, then the electron before it delocalizes into the conduction electron C, it can delocalize into the RVB type spin liquid. So imagine you had some state like some entangled state like this, and uh, of some, and I'll take a simple model of this uh, in the later part of my talk. So you get a spin liquid here, where the conduction electrons, I mean, sorry, the, these layer A electrons are just screened out with each other, and then you still have the conduction electrons sitting there. Uh, and now if you look at the effect of the condo exchange, you find, you know, under RG, it basically doesn't flow. It just, it's, it's, you can look at it estimates order by order. Uh, and, and so the zeroth order picture of this phase then is very, very different from the zeroth order picture of the FL phase. The zeroth order picture of FL phase was non-interacting electrons, just to fill up states. Uh, the zeroth order picture then of this new phase that we call FL star, uh, uh, is that it's only one, only a small, small number of the electrons, which are these uh, number of electrons minus one, which form the small Fermi surface here, which are mobile and form a Fermi surface, which initially at least looks perfectly Fermi liquid-like. But the remaining electrons don't break any symmetries or anything, but form this, this RVB state. Uh, and that's the state we call an FL star. And then you can, you know, uh, uh, the, the content of these papers was to show really through various non-perturbative arguments that this kind of state is stable, uh, that there is a state where JK is in, in a sense irrelevant, and if you look for charged excitations, um, they, are, uh, they appear near a Fermi surface whose area does not obey the conventional Lettinger theorem. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, we think we have some understanding of exactly how uh, uh, Various Lettinger arguments are, are defeated, uh, and you know soon I'll present a gauge theory, but this is just seems quite natural. Okay, so that's the FL star phase. Uh, so it's a, it's another, at least in principle, 
uh, you know, proven to the extent anything is proved in our field, uh, stable state of matter which is compressible, uh, which has a modified theorem. Oh, okay. And there are probably other, many other ways of constructing other compressible phase. I think that's uh, a pretty uh, you know, new field. There are new lot of ideas floating around. Uh, uh, you know, for spin liquids, you have now thousands of different examples. They're eventually, they may all be for compressible phases, metallic phases too. But these are the two simplest kinds. <laughs> so the area in is smaller. Yeah, so this, that's why it's called a small from a surface, right? So A minus. A minus. Ah, oh, sorry, it's n minus one. Yeah. Sorry, <laughs> thank you. It's a over two pi squared equals n minus one. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay. Ah. <laughs> uh, well, I'm glad you caught it. So you're awake. <laughs> and you're awake too. Good. <laughs> All right. So, so that's, those are the phases. And now what am I going to do? I'm going to give you a mean field theory uh, of this phase. And this is a mean field theory based upon an uh, infinite range model that we looked at many years ago. Uh, and, you know, it has some interesting properties and it also has some uh, some properties that did, we didn't like, it just didn't seem right. Uh, and then uh, what I'm going to show you uh, is that if I now look at the holographic theories, the very, at least the very first uh, holographic theory of a, of a metal from the MIT group, um, that their results uh, have almost a perfect match to the properties of this particular infinite range condo lattice. So I'm going to present two mean field theories, both of which may end up being not particularly relevant to anything. Uh, one coming from condensed matter, one coming from string theory, and in this section all I'm going to show you uh, is that those two mean field theories match. Okay. All right, so let me present the condensed matter point of view. So the approximation I'm going to make is that on layer A, on the lower fill layer, uh, I'm going to put infinite range hopping. Uh, in fact, infinite range exchange. And, okay, just to avoid magnetic order, if, I, if, if these were all ferromagnetic, I ran into trouble. If they're anti-ferromagnetic, well, it's possible, interesting things, that some of this could apply there too. There are other sorts of lattices you can do this without any randomness, but the simplest thing to do is to just take Gaussian random variables. So that's the so-called Sherrington Kirkpatrick model uh, of Gaussian random exchange uh, between spins on, an, on this infinitely collected graph. To avoid magnetic order. <laughs> In fact, you don't even that doesn't succeed. Uh, again, a technical detail. If you now also make the spins S U N and also spend n to infinity, then you're okay. <laughs> magnetic order is really hard to get rid of, especially when you have infinite range couplings. <laughs> but if you have infinite range, yeah. constant uh, antiferromagnetic coupling. That's I for, that, yeah yeah I I. I I think it may work. I mean, there's another way to do it using DMFT where you, again, you make some just ansatz, or you, you select some saddle point and expand the border and think it's stable. So, so, yeah, so now I'll say that if I take, for example, a Bethel lattice with infinite, infinite coordination number, then there's certainly a set of metastable states that are of this type. That may not be the global ground states. That's a more subtle question. Well, that would be too realistic. We want to do something really crazy first, so that it can match with string with, uh, with string theory. No, just, just a joke. Just a joke. I will do that in the third part of my talk. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, I should, I should be just, I kind of implied that in my paper, but then when people read the paper, they, they have seemed to have not missed that hint that I was dropping there. But, so now I have to be more explicit. <laughs> Sorry, okay. I'm among friends here, right? <laughs> uh, okay. All right, so, what I, so let's take this model. Uh, and uh, okay, and I'm going to argue that this model is kind of the, what the Reisman Nordstrom black hole, something like this is what the Reisman Nordstrom black hole is giving you. Uh, so how does that work? 
So let's just look at this model and solve it. So in any, like in any infinite range model, the way the solution works is you pick one site as your favorite site and then integrate out everything else. So let's pick this site uh, and they have, so there's just one spin. So we're going to path integral for that one spin and everything else, the environment is this field H, which is fluctuating too, okay? So for now, uh, let me assume that uh, I really don't know how that's fluctuating in time. Uh, uh, and this is, the, this is just the thing that imposes the spin commutation relation in, in, in this path and to go for a single spin that's like a West Zemino term for a particle moving on S2. Uh, uh, so just a zero, it's a zero plus one dimensional field theory with, on S2 with this, with this West Zemino term. That's uh, the world's most complicated way of explaining what a spin is. Uh, okay, so you have this random field which is then created by all the other spins. So for now, I assume I don't know anything about the spin other than the fact that it has power law correlations in time. Uh, so this h of tau, h of zero, decay in power law with an exponent gamma. And uh, in fact, it turns out when you look at the final solution, uh, it also, in fact, finite temperature, it has this conformal type form. Uh, so I just put that in. But you don't have to. You can just work at zero temperature to begin with. So now, now this model of a single spin moving in a fluctuating magnetic field is still quite complicated, but eventually after actually quite a lot of work using combination of large end limits and RG, uh, we think we understand it quite well. And what you find then uh, is that this spin that's fluctuating also has power law correlations with an exponent h which is given exactly by two minus gamma. Okay, and, and uh, I won't go through the, the way how exactly I got that exponent. But again, it seems reasonable. And what you can prove quite easily is that if this, was, this has a conformal form, then in this theory, the answer also has the same uh, conformal form. Okay, finally then, how do you solve this particular model? This particular model, the environment, is the same as this spin. There was nothing special about the spin you picked out. Uh, and therefore, the correlations of H here, which was the environment, should be the same as the correlation of the spin itself. And that fixes, that, that tells you that H equals gamma. When you combine this with this and you get H equals gamma equals one, and that is what's going to give you the marginal Fermi liquid. Uh, if, when I map it to the string theory model, the H is a free parameter, which is determined by the mass of the fermion on ADS2, on, on the ADS4, yeah. So, were the conduction, conduction electrons important for, uh, did they contribute importantly to the dynamics of these spins? Uh, in this approximation, I've just entirely ignored them. Uh, but there are extended models uh, of the type, especially that team your C has studied. You can put them in, and it doesn't change these particular exponents, so they change some other details. Yeah? When you said in response to the exchange, you said that the model wasn't quite right. Yeah. Did you mean that it was infinite? That's one of the things. That are, yeah, but ultimately, what really bothers us the most uh, is the fact this model has a, it has a finite entropy density. And also the self-energy of the electrons is momentum independent completely. Uh, those are two very anomalous things. And here it's clear that those are tied closely to infinite range approximation. <laughs> uh, right, okay, so then I've, I've, I have the spin liquid sitting here, and I, and I guess I should say somewhere here also, this, this spin liquid state has a finite ground state entropy. So it's not a very, uh, and again, the reason for the entropy is closely connected to what I discussed yesterday at the last part of my talk. You know, in the last part of my talk, I had one spin uh, coupling to a CFT, where I knew the CFT and in the spin. Here also, I have this spin coupled to some gapless environment, which is not quite a CFT. It's really a zero plus one dimensional CFT, if you wish. Uh, and so every spin has that entropy associated, with, uh, associated to that problem. And so that every one of them has that entropy, you get an entropy density, which is proportional to the number of spins, which is what I didn't have yesterday. And, and that's why the, there's an entropy problem. So there's a spin liquid with a finite entropy, and, uh, and it's an intimate consequence of having these, multi the, the, these zero plus one dimensional fixed points, uh, which, are, which I argued yesterday were ADS2 type physics at every position in space. So that's what ADS2 cross R2 means, that you have this, uh, conformal physics at every point in space, independent conformal physics. Okay, so, so in this model also, you can put in the conduction electrons now and, and see that this is not very strong. And so finally, now you can write down a theory uh, for the 
fermion Green's function. You have your, uh, uh, your electrons on layer B. Those are coupled to these spins by the condor exchange. And the spins here are, are on this side, and they have this power law spin correlation function, uh, which is just completely local uh, in space. OK, so now you can now actually, it turns out to be useful to rewrite this. Uh, see what's coming next. OK, I'll rewrite this in a slightly different way. I'm going to take this theory and just define a new operator, which I call f, which is sigma dot s, which is the layer A spin, times the layer B fermions. And the reason I want to do this is this is a fermion now, which knows something about layer B, but it's a low energy fermion. So I don't want a Fermi operator that just removes an electron from layer A, because that's too hard. The layer A is just full. All I want to do is just rotate the spin on layer A. That's what this does. And this C is on layer B. Uh, and so this is a, this is a composite operator, uh, which is low energy. It's the simplest composite operator, uh, which is low energy, which involves uh, the charge of an electron and something on layer A. Okay. <laughs> so this is just a rewriting of the condor coupling. I write it as a mixing between this composite fermion and the physical fermion on layer B, the, the small Fermi surface fermion. Uh, OK, so this, uh, some of you may already start to recognize this. Uh, uh, but anyway, with this, now I can do perturbation theory on sigma, uh, oh, sorry, in JK. Uh, and I will get a conduction electron self-energy with its exponent h plus 1, which is also has this local conformal form uh, with h equals 1. All right, so uh, now my claim is that all these properties, this sigma c, um, the entropy, this effective theory for the low energy phase of this FL star state are essentially identical to the MIT theory of the holographic metal. Uh, so what are, the, what, are the, uh, what are the corrections? Well, first of all, both models have z equals infinity and a finite ground state entropy. Uh, secondly, this theory, which I just wrote down, is exactly the theory, semi-holographic theory written down by Faulkner and Ponchinsky to describe the uh, uh, ADS2 curves R2 state, uh, where you have where now these F are these IR operators, gauge invariant IR operators, which are telling you something about the A resonance from black hole, and they're coupling to these probe physical fermions. Uh, what you see here is that these Fs are you know this kind of composite operator of the spins on layer A coupling to the physical fermion. So layer A is like like my black hole, <laughs> and layer B is the probe. Okay. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. So the, the lower layer is the strongly coupled layer, uh, and that has these, at least in this approximation, I took the lower layer having infinite range couplings uh, will give me uh, 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 this, this kind of factorized conformal field theory with the infinite set of conformal points, and uh, OK. Uh, did, didn't the graphic picture have operator dimensions that depended on k squared? Yeah, so here these are independent of k. So, but in the end, and the low energy limit for the gravity, it only, only the value at kf mattered for anything, right? at least the leading. Yeah, so, so there are differences, of course, at that level. But you could probably get those differences by putting in weak couplings between your sides? By going beyond strictly infinite range, I, yeah, I suspect you could. Yeah, but that makes it quite harder to solve it. Uh, yeah, and those are all highly non-universal. And just I think even in the gravity picture, I think they just depended upon. Well, maybe not. No, okay. Gravity was quite <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. True. At true. Very low energies dependent only on kf. That's right. That's so. That's what I'm saying. The end is only one exponent. Yeah. So the leading pictures are also. Yeah. It, this is a different model. It's a, uh, but I think the lesson here is that you know, having. R2 degeneracy of ADS2 is just is not good, <laughs> at least from my condensed matter perspective. Uh, mm, right, OK. Oh, yeah, what I was going to say. Now, of course, you could go to this, this infinite range model I defined right here and, and really look at it more carefully and look for its global ground states. And in fact, and do 1 over n corrections, because in fact, you only solve it in some large n limit. Uh, and you find that. Invariably, it's unstable to some kind of spin glass state. Um, so, so the entropy does get lifted uh, if you look carefully enough. It's a consequence of one over n. 
Yeah, yeah. And uh, in, fact, in fact, it turns out to be a temperature of order e to the minus n. Uh, so the very low temperatures. But n is 1 in the end. So. <laughs> All right, so uh, Senthil is gone, but this will make Senthil happy, but it'll make you happy. So why don't I do the other thing, but I do something realistic. <laughs> okay, so I want to now turn to the gauge theory of FL and FL star phases, which the way uh, Senthil and I and others did it uh, over the past few years. And these turn out to be a theories which have this a gauge structure, which is U1 cross U1. One U1 is a gauge, and the other U1 is a global charge. And I'm going to suggest that uh, there's really quite a close connection between very recent work in, in holographic metals and all these semi-holographic type RGs and states that people are talking about uh, may uh, again look quite similar uh, to these theories. So now that I'm going to go back to completely a conventional condensed matter point of view uh, and, and try to talk about these two phases, both the SL and FL star again for both layers. All right, so as I've emphasized, the interactions are strong only on layer, the lower layer. Um, and so I want to keep better track of the charge uh, on the lower layer. I'm going to do it by the so-called rotor method here. Uh, so I introduce on each site a fictitious rotor, uh, uh, which is just some angular variable that runs on a circle. So you know how to quantize the particle moving in a circle. It states that I n theta, n is an integer, and have energy n squared. Okay, uh, so the lowest energy state is when all the n's are zero. Okay, now what I want to do is to identify this n with the charge on that site. So if there's one electron on that site, n is zero. And when there's zero electron on that site, n is minus one. When there's two electrons on the site, n is uh, plus one. Okay, uh, and now of course I have to keep track of the spin on the electron on that site. Uh, and that spin, I have to do that, I introduce a new fermion called the spin-on. Uh, and this fermion x spin-on will have a spin index alpha. So what I'm doing here is I'm taking my physical electron on layer A and writing as a product of this rotor uh, operator and this fermion operator. So I'll introduce new degrees of freedom. Uh, and that means some redundancy and naturally a gauge structure. Uh, but I want to get the physical Hilbert space, and there's a Gauss's law that puts me back into the physical Hilbert space. So in this way of thinking, the empty site has a rotor with angular momentum minus one. Uh, the one site has no rotor, rotor in the S, angular momentum zero, and one fermion. And this W occupied site has a rotor in the angular momentum plus one and two, two spin-ons. Uh, and now you see that all the physical states of the theory obey this, that the number of fermions is equal to the angle minus nr is 1 on every side. So now this new theory for the rotor and the fermions, uh, of course, has many states that are not these. And those have all to be removed from the theory. And of course, we know how to do that quite well over many years of work in condensed matter physics. Uh, that's done by restoring gauge invariance and putting an emergent gauge field. And as long as you maintain the gauge invariance, everything's going to be OK you'll get physical answers. Uh, so, uh, but it's a, it turns out to be a gauge theory at very strong coupling, of course. Uh, so, uh, in other words, if I'm, uh, this constraint is basically the, the conserved charge associated with this transformation. And because I have a conserved charge on every site, this is a gauge transformation. Uh, so if I change the phase of F and theta this way, then all of these states remain invariant. They're all gauge neutral. OK, so having done this, um, I, can, you know, I can turn to my particle physics type thinking and just write on a field theory. Of, I'm going to write on a phenomenological theory of not for the Cs. The Cs are too hard to work with, but for the Fs and the thetas. Uh, and how am I going to write it down? Well, I'm just doing the simplest possible thing. I'm just going to use symmetries. So I co-strain and go to long wavelengths. And all these things, uh, you know, in principle, are quite hard to do. But the magic of gauge invariance is just tells us it restricts very strongly the kind of terms you're going to get. Uh, what's somewhat more non-trivial is to convince yourself that that's enough, that once you impose gauge invariance, you're not allowing any physical states, unphysical states, when you're doing the calculation. Uh, so just have this U1 emergent U1 gauge invariance. Uh, and also for fun, I introduced the physical electromagnetic field called A sub x. 
So there's my U1 cross U1 structure that I promised. And I simply write down the most general field theory for now three types of particles. You know, once you have all these U1s floating around, at the minimum you need these three types of particles. You have the electron C on layer B on the top layer. You have the spin-ons on the lower layer. And you have the rotor, which I'll just call a boson B, well, which connects them all up. And all the terms here are immediately apparent from this gauge transformation. So you have two U1s. There's the gauge U1 and the global U1. And notice the boson B transforms under both. Uh, and uh, the spin-ons only transform under the internal gauge field. And the physical electrons on layer B only transform under the electromagnetic gauge field. OK. Uh, so with this gauge invariance, you can see that these are the only allowed terms at low orders. Uh, you have to worry a little bit about where the chemical potentials and the difference between the two layers come in, and these epsilon r's and epsilon f's. Uh, these are the conventional covariant gradients. And I just took a quadratic dispersion for everything in sight. Uh, I even made the boson uh, have a second order time derivative. And I expand in the boson. And finally, there's this Yukawa coupling, which is allowed, a unique Yukawa coupling that's allowed between these fields. You made some comment about the internal gauge field being a strong coupling. Yeah, so that's basically read the fact that the, uh, you can write down some f minus f squared terms. Their coefficients are 0. Typically, it's a 1 over e squared times f squared. I just put it equal to 0. But internal one started out being compact. Yeah. OK, for this, it turns out in the end, for these states that I'm discussing, the compactness is not important. But that's, of course, a very important question, uh, which I've had many years of my life on. So, <laughs> But yeah, I, for this lecture, I will just ignore the compactness. I guess I just wanted to know, how do you decide when, to, when one can ignore it and when one So to ignore compactness, you, you need some low energy excitation that carry the gate charge. And, uh, what uh, I guess the, uh, Mike Hermely et al. and Sung Sik Lee showed very beautifully is that once you have a Fermi surface of any excitation that carries a gate charge, the monopoles are totally suppressed. Then, yes. it's, okay. then it's okay. Then yeah, so then it's for sure okay. If you have only direct points, then it's a, then it's a balanced thing. And, and if, if matter, then, you then you have to worry about monopoles. And so then you, get, you can at the best get, you can still get exotic phases, but they involve discrete gauge theories like Z2. Um, all right, and this is a coupling that converts. So what is this coupling? In fact, this coupling, as the name suggests, is just the interlayer tunneling. If we just go back and map things out, this W that I had from one layer to the other, that's exactly this coupling. All right, so now what are the phase, so, and, and if this, in case I forget to say this, I think much of the recent work in string theory, which is going beyond the ads 2 cross r 2 state, kind of, kind of screening the, uh, the horizon in many ways by, uh, putting in a finite Feynman and fermion density subconsistently, or putting in various dilaton fields that screen the gate charge, uh, in the end goes to some phase that's only poorly understood. And, and my, my conjecture is that even, you know, you have these two mean field theories that agreed. And now we are, we are trying to improve things on both sides. And hopefully, they'll still start to keep and continue to agree when we improve both. <laughs> All right, so now I'm describing how the condensed matter side has been improved. Uh, OK. So all right, so now one very crucial point. For, so, and, and now you know, here in this theory, the lattice is gone. This is a continuum theory and may well be some, like something being studied in string theory. So all the interesting lattice effects that ultimately were really important to get a spin liquid to begin with are now, you know, have been accounted for. And now I can work with a continuum theory that has a hope of being realized in some holographic theory. Because there's no lattice here anymore. Okay, so I did the hard work of putting the lattice. Oomplop is, is not yet in, and so that may be a problem. But okay, let's just work with. <laughs> Ignore Oomplop here. <laughs> um, all right, so now I was saying there are two U1 symmetries, and, and one feature of these uh, these Fermi surface area theorems is that there's one Fermi surface area theorem for every U1, including whether it's gauged or not. And this is something Stephen Powell and I uh, argued a few years back. And so here, you see, and, and the way you get it is extremely simple. You just look at the charges that go with the gauge transformation. So here, F and B transform with one with the opposite signs. So the numbers of those charges, which is basically the derivative of the free energy with respect to the chemical potential, should be equal 
uh, to some fix. It's always fixed to some number, which you can figure out. In this case, this, this is just the number of electrons on layer A, which is one in the lattice model. But if, for the continuum theory, it doesn't matter. This NA could be almost anything. And there's a second one associated with this transformation. And now you add the number of Cs and the Bs, uh, and, and that should be equal to the remaining electrons. So in fact, there's even Lettinger, this, you can view this as a Lettinger theorem for bosons because you have to measure the number of bosons and that's related to the area of some Fermi surface. So you can get interesting phases of bosons which have Fermi surfaces. They really, if the bosons don't bose condense, they, will, they do have to be Fermi surfaces because of theorems like this. Oh. Okay, but I have, two, I have two Fermis, I have two constraints, so this is very, very different from my beginning of my talk where I said there was only one constraint. I've got two, so where's, who are the two? Well, of course, what this means uh, is that if I assume both U1 and both U1s are unbroken, then I cannot get a Fermi liquid. I get a different state, and that is the FL star state. So the FL star state has two Fermi surfaces whose areas are separately conserved. There's the area of the top layer, which is exactly what you expect, and now I have the correct place, N minus <laughs> one. Uh, and then there's, there's a Fermi surface on, on the bottom layer too, but it's a spin-on Fermi surface. It has area one uh, because of lattice effects, but in the field theory, this could be anything. Uh, and this would be changed correspondingly. And this, and another important point, this is a, it's not a real Fermi surface because it's not of electrons. It's a, there's no charge of the spin-ons that appear on this Fermi surface. Uh, uh, it, it's sometimes called a hot Fermi surface or a spin-on Fermi surface. It's, it's, it's not, so if you did full emission on this kind of Fermi surface, uh, well, it depends on some of the other details, you won't see fermionic quasi-particles. But nevertheless, there's still a theorem conserving its area. Uh, and this is the phase where you, conserve, you preserve both symmetries, and that's B equals zero. Okay. Uh, and then there's the other phase then. Then naturally, you could think of a phase where B is not zero. That's the Higgs phase of this gauge theory you break U1 cross U1 to the diagonal U1. And what that means is that there's only one theorem, which is the sum of these two, because you're breaking it to the diagonal, you have to take the sum of these two. I mean, you take the sum of these two, you see, well, you just measure that sum of all the fermions is equal to N. The bosons go out of the picture because they are condensed. So every time you have Bose condensation, you lose a, Lett you lose a Lettinger theorem. Whether you have fermions or bosons, they have this one Lettinger theorem for every conserved U1 quantity minus the number of Bose condensates. That's a very general kind of statement. Uh, all right, so, so that's the Fermi liquid phase. So this is how you get back the, what I started my lecture with, just the simplest state. It's a Higgs phase of this gauge theory. Okay, so to get a Fermi liquid, uh, you almost certainly have to think about such Higgs phases in the string theory also. <laughs> all right, so now let me make a connection to all the semi-holographic RG work. So let's begin with the semi-liquid phase. Uh, and here, let's do it in, again in two, two parallel steps. Let's do it from a condensed matter point of view. So from the condensed matter point of view, we've condensed B. And here's my Lagrangian right here. Looks like a big mess, but I just condensed B. And I have these uh, F fermions and the C fermions which mix each other. Now they mix freely because B is just a constant. Uh, so let's, let's look at the low energy theory of that phase. So the low energy theory of that phase uh, will have just the boson. There will be a Goldstone boson in principle, which I have to put in. And that will then couple <coughs> diagonally to both U1s. Uh, sorry, so we, yeah. Uh, B also had a local gauge symmetry, right? Yeah, this is local. That's, where, that's so what this E mu is. Mean, like, can you break that? I mean, it has yeah. a valid source theorem or something. Uh, okay. Well, okay. Uh, I think you know those are uh, no, it's, no. I mean, <laughs> uh, you know, Elitzer's theorem is really just saying uh, you know everything has to be gauge invariant. I don't. They, we know that you, it's, a, it's a dynamical state phases of gauge theories, and we we sometimes we, when we talk about Higgs phase. It, it's one way to think about it in a gauge fixed language. You fix the gauge and then you just condense your boson. Uh, but if you, 
If you, and that's a very convenient language, but ultimately what you're really saying is that the photon has a mass and, if you, and you can only term, think in terms of gauge invariant objects, which are no charge, it's a very complicated way to talk about it. But it, it's perfectly reasonable to imagine that it's just condensed. Um, uh, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, Higgs phases can, you know, that's, you know, you know the weak theory of weak interaction is exactly this. So why, why is the SC2 plus U1 of uh, Weinberg's alarm allowed to break? I mean, if this is the same thing. And, and this can also happen for non-compact gauge field, and I don't think the compact has anything to do with it. <laughs> and uh, with the, whether, you know, there's like this, and when they break it this way, the Higgs phases are, are not any different from the confining phases. So it's kind of a matter of choice, you know, why in QCD we talk of confinement and why in the weinberg salam model we think of it as a Higgs phase. It's just a question of numbers, what's a more convenient way to think about the excitation, but they're smoothly connected. So these, you can think of them as confining phases if you want. <laughs> My particle physics friends agree with me. <laughs> okay, so what Nickel and Sohn, now, so sorry, I was describing the condensed matter point of view. So you have this Goldstone boson, which, which is Higgsed by this gauge field, so it's everything's gauge invariant. And you couple also the external gauge field. You have these F spin-ons, let's integrate them out and get some effective action for the gauge field. You also have these conduction electrons, but they're not doing very much, you know, they're just right there. Okay, and that's my low energy theory then. And now my point is that if you know, many of you have mentioned this paper before, most of you have not read it, I'm sure, uh, but if you look at it, there's an equation in the paper that's just exactly that. Uh, and, and what's their reasoning? Their reasoning is you've got some strongly coupled fluid uh, in the IR, uh, which we don't understand very well, and you're probing that fluid in the UV by just looking at correlation functions of the electrons. And, and, and the way we're going to connect the UV and the IR together is that you don't know much about that strongly coupled fluid, but it's very useful to introduce temporarily some emergent gauge field, which Sohn and Nickel define explicitly in terms of the, uh, of the uh, um, dual theory. So you introduce an emergent gauge field, and then you also have a Goldstone boson which breaks that symmetry to the diagonals. There's a global you want having to do the charges, and you break it down to the diagonal. So in, in this language there, the UV are the, the electrons, which coupled to the physical electromagnetic field. The IR fields are the spin-ons, which I integrated them out. Uh, and then the Goldstone boson is the phase of this rotor field. And uh, you know, it looks completely exact, it is the same. The difference is that now you have to, of course, make some approximation to describe this. And, and in the Sohn nickel paper, they make some simple, uh, they, they, they take, again, some kind of infinite set of conformal field theory, zero plus one dimensional conformal field theories to compute this. And at that point, I think it leads to somewhat unphysical answers. But if you had a more careful computation of this in a holographic context where you didn't have this infinite set of conformal field theories uh, of CFT2s, no, of ADS2s, uh, then you will get some realistic information. Uh, similarly, in the other phase, in the FL star phase, so in this language, what should we do? Well, B is not condensed, it's gapped. So B should be just thrown out of the picture, integrated out. And this is actually just, when you integrate out B, that's the schrieffer wolf transformation in disguise. You will then introduce a coupling between your physical electron C and these IR fermions F, which is just a condo exchange coupling. Uh, and just like I did before, I decoupled this and write it this way where F uh, is this composite operator of the local spins and the physical electrons. That is, this is the simplest composite operator, which is totally gauge invariant, meaning that uh, it doesn't involve any of these emergent gauge fields, uh, and also has the charge of an electron. And that's exactly how uh, Faulkner and Polchinski defined their IR field F. They said it's the simplest gauge invariant operator, uh, uh, which can couple to physical UV fermions. Uh, and that's exactly what you get here, the same type of Polchinski uh, uh, Faulkner type coupling. Uh, now then they go ahead and make an approximation for the correlations of F, but those, the, but that's dependent on ADS2 cross R2, at least in, in the first paper, uh, and that reproduces the, again, consistent with what I said before, uh, the physics of the FL star phase. So they are, I guess I think I'm pretty much done. That's, uh, so there, what, what I've shown you then is that there are these two phases, which 
we can essentially prove exist two compressible phases, FL and FL star. Uh, and if I look at the sea of theories in uh, string theory today of compressible phases, uh, they seem to be one or the other. Uh, and in fact, even with the semi-holographic RG that Mukun talked about, uh, there's the one approach where you do the RG on the gauge fields, and, and that gives you this structure of nickel and so on. And then there's the approach where you do direct fermions, and that gives you this structure of uh, Pochinsky and Faulkner. Uh, so what we'd love to do is describe the quantum critical point between them, and that would be the critical point between, in Baskin's phase diagram, the red and blue lines, well, these are FL and FL star. <laughs> it doesn't agree with that, but okay, that's one possibility. And there's a critical point between them, uh, which is then a phase transition involving change of Fermi surfaces, uh, which is the Higgs transition. It's a Higgs confining transition between de this is the deconfined phase and this is the confining phase. So there's a Higgs confining transition in the presence of a Fermi surface. That would be a very non trivial quantum critical point without any broken symmetry. Uh, and, and, and solving or classifying such sets of critical points could be the answer to high TC. <laughs> okay. So that's the end of my talk. <laughs> yeah, I guess I finished very quickly. Well, <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> yeah. I just want to make sure I understand the last point you made. So yeah. you say you have the Fermi liquid phase, you have the FL star phase, yeah. and you say you might expect a phase transition going from one to the other. Yeah, so actually let me, yeah. So I, I guess I've meant much more rapidly than I thought I would. So here, let's consider the, okay, this a complicated field here, but very, very simple. Forget all these gradient terms. There are three fields, F, B, and C. Uh, and there's the canonical, just gauge invariance detectors. And then there are these S and U, which take D or R. So let me draw the phase diagram as a function of S. Okay. So for S really large and positive, B is zero. And for S negative, B is not zero. Okay, if I just did mean field theory, this is what I would do. Uh, now, if I didn't have any gauge field, I said there's a broken symmetry. But of course, that's fake. That's really the point that Chris, um, Chris made. Uh, there is a gauge invariance, so, but, that does, but that doesn't mean these phases are smoothly connected. Okay, there is still a phase transition between them. And there's many ways of seeing it. In this system, the simplest way to see it is just look at the Lettinger theorems. They look at the area of the Fermi surfaces. There's a non-trivial quantum feature. In this phase, if I now try to prove various Lettinger theorems, I get two Lettinger theorems. I conclude that I must guess these two Fermi surfaces with fixed, fixed area. I have a spin-on Fermi surface uh, with area one and a small Fermi surface A uh, with n minus one. On the other hand, uh, on this side, if I do perturbative analysis of this phase, I only get one large Fermi surface with area n. Okay. And that's a Fermi liquid. If I look at the singularity of the fermion Green's function, even perturbatively, here or here, they look completely different. So that's enough to prove that these are separate phases, even though the actual condensate is not a physical overall gauge, no, it's a gauge dependent quantity. So there must be a phase transition between that. So there's a quantum critical point which would be in the particle physics language, this is the Higgs or the confining phase, uh, and this is the, the deconfined phase. So you have some strongly coupled gates, you know, you have some, on the boundary, we have, we have described everything in terms of a gauge theory. There, there's only a boundary here. We just only have the condensed matter system, and, and that has two phases, which can be sharply distinguished. Uh, and without any broken symmetries associated with them, yeah. Just in terms of uh, the variables in the condensed matter system, yeah. can you describe it in terms of these, uh, in terms of these parameters in this effective Lagrangian? Yes. So just in terms of some thermodynamic quantities, what could you vary to see the transition? Then I can translate that to the gravity description and try to... Uh, well, okay, so let's see. So. Well, uh, so if I, let, let me answer the question of various levels. You can take the condo lattice model. Suppose I take the condo lattice model. Uh, where's my condo lattice model? So here's my condo lattice Hamiltonian. Three terms, this term, this term, and this term. Uh, so what I vary is the ratio of J condo to JH. 
and roughly this thing, S, is basically proportional to, uh, uh, this is JH over, yeah, when J condo is large, you go that way. Okay. That's one way to think about it. Uh, another even simpler way is to take this double layer model I began everything with. Take this double layer model, there you W over T. Vary the interlayer tunneling. Very interlayer tunneling, W over T. When W is really large, then you mix these very freely, you form this state. When W is a weak, the first thing you'll do is form a spin liquid in the bottom layer, uh, and these will separate, and you form this state. Okay. Uh, you know, I mean, these kind of states, uh, many people talked about over the years, but I, our paper in 2003 and four was, I think, the first to really clearly argue that these are separate distinguishable phases and there's a quantum critical point between them, and this is like a Higgs deconfining transition. Uh, okay. Yes, oh, and in the experiment, okay, maybe I can say something about the experiment. In the experiment, all they're doing is take, change, changing their density, okay? So when you have low densities, then the Coulomb interaction is not so important. You get a Fermi liquid, and here you have a FL phase uh, where it, it, it looks like you get a heavy Fermi liquid, but you're still mixing the two together. Uh, and then at very high densities, it seems like uh, they claim that you've got what in their language is basically an FL star phase where the two layers are independent of each other. Uh, you know, There's a beautiful system. Unfortunately, the only thing you can do is measure specific heat or do NMR. You can't go in and really look at these little layers of helium atoms so easily. The temperatures are extremely low. There's no scale here, I'm sorry, but <laughs> they're down in the early Kelvin range. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, so this phase diagram here is actually here. This NC, if you just read what they're saying, this phase diagram here is essentially this. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, you could vary almost anything. And basically, the idea is you want to, well, these probe fermions, so, so in the MIT inspired approach, the probe fermions are very weakly coupled to the rest of the matter. And that always gives you these deconfined phases. In the uh, model that Nickel and Sol looked at, um, you know, they, they have some confining gauge forces. They immediately go to the confining phase, and they have this both, that's why they have this emergent gauge field and the Goldstone boson. Uh, and, and so there's a much stronger coupling there, and then so they're here. Uh, so one of the challenges is now to put every, all of this together and actually get this critical point. Uh, this is my challenge to the string theorists. <laughs> I have a yeah. Question, yeah. So uh, you showed the condo lattice model. Yes. Yes. The, uh, model. Yeah, that is a version of it. Yeah. Yes, I, I didn't quite uh, understand the connection between you know, going from one model to another. No, that, so here's the corner lattice model. Right. So at least the, in this picture I've drawn, this JH is only between nearest neighbors. Yes. Now I just allow JH to be between any two spins. So that's the Sherrington Kirkpatrick condo model, if you wish, where I, I take this, I, so the model I solved modulo some you know, caveats, but let me simplify. The model I, we can solve is if you take this to be basically I not, independent of I and J is with I not equal to J. Every spin coupled to every other spin. You take that model, keep everything else the same, that can be solved. And that gives you the physics of ADF2 cross R2 I claim. What I want to do is not take that limit, take something more serious where you've got near, only short range exchange. That was the last part of my talk. And I think much of the recent work by you know, Sandeep and uh, also, by, I guess, who was on Tron Hartnell on these electron stars. Um, they're all moving towards that direction where you get rid of this AD2 cross R2 uh, horizon uh, and get something, some more complicated geometries, uh, which I believe will end up with more realistic descriptions of these two phases. Maybe other phases too, who knows? There might be some surprises. There probably uh, surely will be. But these are the simplest examples of phases I can think of. <laughs> Yes. Uh, I know it's commonly legal. I guess I don't doubt it that it's a quantum critical point. Yeah. But is, is there an argument that shows it must be a quantum critical point as opposed to EG to uh, the, the end point of a line of fixed point, critical end point of a line of fixed point? Uh, well, in a sense, both these phases are critical phases, so there's lines of fixed points everywhere. Uh, well, I mean, what I was thinking about is, is it, you know, quantum security physics where you have, say, two channels, 
Yeah. The fixed point is the critical fixed point for the two impurity yeah. level. Yeah. And it is quantum critical. Yes. But more common quantum phase transitions are those kinds of problems where Kaufman and Stalin's like and they're critical endpoints of quantum fixed points. Uh, so, you know, that's, you know, at least in this way, the, the large end type way that we solve this theory, it is a critical point. Uh, but yeah, no, there could be lots of other exotic so possible. That's all, that's all, that goes with the, the, the methods we use as APIs. Well, I mean, that's also distinguished. I, I would say that this field theory as written, you know, with small modifications, is a very generic and field theory with generic phase diagram to understand. Uh, we don't understand it. We can, we can only analyze it in certain certain limits. Uh, so there was a large end limit where we analyzed the field theory. Where is the field theory? Sorry. Uh, here, this one. Uh, but, you know, st starting last couple of years, especially work of Sun Sik Lee, we have understood that large end expansion uh, has all kinds of problems. Uh, so, it, you know, everything is open to question. If we don't, unlike the problem I talked about last time, uh, where there are condensed matter methods with in the end, it pretty much tell us what's going on. Here, at this point, you know, we are really searching for other methods. Uh, and that's, you know, that's why in our desperation there. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, but here there, there's really our, there is nothing, you know, there's, it's, it's totally open, I agree. Uh, and we want to understand these strong coupling phases. Uh, and this is really, I think, where string theory can really play a very important role. <laughs> okay. Can I, can I have a, one, one or two words? So, of course, I spent a, you don't mind, so I, I, first of all, I want to thank you and all the organizers for everything you did, but especially I also want to, I'm really, you know, very grateful that all these distinguished physicists came all over from India for this very wonderful meeting. So, I'm, thank you all for coming. I really learned a lot, so. <laughs> Thank you.